with us this afternoon. Time or if you're visiting us online for the first time, we are grateful to have you in our midst. We thank the Lord that you're here on the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. In our gospel, God's faithful and generous people put their trust in Jesus, even his hard teaching, and they commit to follow him. In our Old Testament of Jeremiah, there's just so much in there, but it's pretty clear that we are blessed when we trust the Lord. And we're blessed when our trust is in the Lord. And so many times we say we trust the Lord, but our trust is in so many other things. And he goes on to tell us that even our hearts can be wicked. Amen? And we move to our Psalms, our, our, our Psalms and we, we learn again that if we stay away from wicked people, there's a chance that we might be happy. And there's a chance that we may learn to be righteous. But when we have a wicked heart, that wicked person that we need to have clean is ourselves, amen? And it's difficult to stay away from ourselves. So we need to fill our heart with the word of God so that wickedness will be removed, amen? Amen. Let us pray. No. My message this afternoon, the title of my message this afternoon is coming from Luke, the, uh, is is coming from Luke, the sixth chapter, the 17th through the 26th verse, and it's blessings and woes of the Christian life. Let us pray. Almighty God, your living word gives us light for our path. Your spirit provides us strength for our journeys. Your love binds us together and makes us whole. We praise and we thank you for this day, for your many mercies. Lord, you you say in your word, before I was formed in my mother's womb that you knew me and you loved me. So Father God, help me to have that same agape love for others. Father, I pray that you give me a message right now to speak, that I may speak your word boldly, Lord God, and make known the gospel secret. Amen? Amen. (laughs) When I discussed my message with Bishop Redfern this morning, he asked me what would I speak on, and I said, oh, well, I guess I'll speak on the Beatitudes. You know, we all know the Beatitudes and Bible study ever since we were little girls. So he asked me if I heard Dr. Manley's sermon at the Catalyst Prayer Breakfast. I said, no, I had to take Jasmine to school. And that's probably a good thing because I'm not Dr. Manley. Then he said, well, many preachers may prefer another text from the lectionary this, uh, this Sunday. Perhaps the consoling message about the resurrection in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Some of us find it easier to wait until we had a chance to use Matthew's version of the Beatitudes and avoid talking about the woes we find in Luke's account. And I thought about what he was saying But I had already gotten started. And one thing I like is a challenge. And I trust and believe that every message I write, that the Lord has gone before me, and then he comes up behind me and give me a little push. So here we we go with it. Unfortunately, even Matthew's Beatitudes are not the spiritualized version many claimed him to be. And when Jesus is talking about God's love for the poor in spirit, we can be assured that he is talking about God's love for the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the sick, the powerless, the stepped on, the pushed down, the left out, the crushed, and the oppressed. And it's pretty hard to imagine how a person who is any of these things could also 
be poor in spirit. Well, after several trips to East, Central, and West Africa, and several places in the U.S., many of those in poverty and certainly are certainly not poor in spirit. I'm amazed of their faith, the faith that keeps them holding on. Such as they have, the little that they have, they are willing to share. I read those words in the gospel to mean broken in spirit, depleted, empty, the walking dead. I think, I, I think an opportunity is missed when we as preachers avoid this message to preach. Other parts of the good news in chapter 4 of Luke's gospel, Jesus is famously stirred up. He stirred up his hometown folks <laughs> in Nazareth by announcing that Isaiah's prophecy of good news for the poor was fulfilled in their hearing that day. Man, they ran him out of town. Today, after a time of praying up on the mountain, Jesus has gathered his disciples, brought them down to a place accessible to many people, many different people from many kinds of areas, including the Gentiles and the crowds of people who had been marginalized because of disease or unclean spirit. You know how we do in the church. We separate ourselves for those unholy. We separate ourselves from those who are unclean. The text says that he heals not just a few, but all of those who come to him, hungering in so many ways for dignity, for acceptance, for, acceptance, for wholeness, for help, for forgiveness, for freedom, for hope. The difference in Luke account with Jesus speaking on the same level as the crowd. See, he came down. He was amongst the crowd. He wasn't looking down on them, and he was speaking to them, rather than from above, up on the mountain, as in Matthew's gospel. This is very significant. Jesus came down to their level to address the people. All the people had to offer is their enthusiasm and devotion. They had nothing else. But these people were the beginning of Jesus' new movement. And despite their own poverty, despite their own needs, they recognized that they were in the presence of something new, some beyond Something beyond normal. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever been in a place where you knew you were in the presence of God? I could imagine that there may have been a moment of uneasiness with the possibility and hope, even for those who had felt hopeless and abandoned. Jesus addressed the crowd using the second person rather than the third. Blessed are you, not those who. Because Jesus is speaking intimately and compassionately to the crowd and identifies with the crowd by standing with them rather than above them. Sometimes when, when I have an opportunity to speak at an engagement, I, when I am permitted to speak and walk around with the people, sometimes they receive what you're saying so much clearer and they understand that you're not talking down to them, that you are experiencing some of the things that they are also experiencing. Luke tells his own story. His version of Jesus' sermon Differ, differs somewhat in other ways as well. According to the difference in length, Luke's account is shorter at 30 verses compared to Matthew's at 107. But there are also half as many Beatitudes and perhaps most notably are the four woes added, the warnings 
in verse 6, 24 through 25. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speaks well of you. If everybody's saying good things about you, something wrong. For that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Don't let anybody stand around you telling you you're wonderful. Everything about you is good. They either want something or they're lying. Amen? We might call them to these who refuse to hear and embrace these core teachings. We might say that they are the logical consequences of turning away from God's vision for the world. Luke doesn't candy coat it. He gives a stern, he gives it to them straight. He wants all to know that Jesus means what he says and he means what he does. Jesus walk, walks the walk, then he talks the talk. And we come to know who he is as much by what he does as what he says. In his compassionate response to human suffering and his firm persistence in the face of criticism, we learn that the teacher means every word he says. He doesn't preach a pacified gospel, say just what we want to hear, and to make us feel good. He preaches the word, the word of God. Jesus makes it plain in his sermon here. He is proclaiming clearly in his ministry that the reign of God is all about us. And since, we, since that, he is laying out the plan not only for those new disciples in the crowd, but, he, but, but join them, but for us also. Or for the crowd that joined them, but he, he, he wrote out the plan for us as well. What it means to be his followers, because his reign, because he reigns, and he shall reign forevermore. Some would say, this is a hard message to preach. This message of blessings and woes in a culture as rich as we are here in America. It's easy to talk about the resurrection and to avoid the woes. And if this message does nothing else, it forces us to take a hard look at ourselves. In our private Bible study, I challenge you, in your private Bible study, I challenge you to read this text. Don't soften the message. Read it, not making excuses. And hear God speak to you today. In your own setting about who you are, about your material possessions, about poverty and the suffering of so many of God's children. And tempting, and, and tempting for us as comfortable Christians to resent, it is tempting for us as comfortable Christians to resent liberation theology. Who speaks of God, preferential option for the poor. We don't want to hear about that. But the teaching in this text directs our attention to Jesus' teaching. That the poor are blessed. That is favored by God. I have been asked, why is God biased towards the poor? My quick answer is, I don't know. I was studying and trying to figure out and looking to see if I could find someone to explain to me what their definition was. Gucci Stravoltz, Gucci uh, Tri-Razez, and I'm probably messing up his name, 
But he explained it best to my knowledge. He explains that bias, that the bias of God, God has a preferential love for the because they are necessary better than others. Morally or religiously, but simply because they are poor and living in an unhumane situation that is con contrary to God's will. He said, I hope my life tries to give testimony to the message of the gospel. Above all that God loves the world and he loved those who are poorest within it. So this privileged position of the poor is based on God. And, our, and, our, uh, and so we need to remember that. We need to remember that what he's speaking of is the universal of God's agape love. So Jesus reminds us about what we heard. The mighty may be flying high now, but they will be brought down. Those who are pressed down will be lifted up, the empty filled, and those who are filled will waste what it feels like, will taste what it feels like to be empty. The woes say that God examines the human state of affairs, and he is displeased. Does any of this matter to Christians today? When you think about it, when you go in your quiet time and you read this scripture and you think about all that's going on in the news today, not only think about yourselves, but think about the people that you support and, 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 and figure out if this really matters to Christians today because we hear both the blessings and woes and this rare opportunity to preach on this text. We can highlight the, that understanding of the, the reign of God as an era of revival. We read in our Bibles that Jesus' ministry turned things upside down. We read earlier in Mark 4 how he was treated by his hometown. When you are watching televangelists, the news network, even your pastor preaching in the pulpit, do you wonder if this really matters to Christians today? How have we Christians managed to wander so far such of, how have we Christians managed to wander so far such an understanding, focusing on fine parts of doctrine, exclusionary teaching and practice, and often finding the level of comfort at and amassing an incredible wealth in our social, our society around us? Jesus was speaking to a desperate but hopeful crowd. The desperation of the crowd, the day they were eager to follow Jesus' plan, a revolution that promised them a share of the world in which they live. They didn't seem to have a lot of questions. You know, sometimes we have a lot of questions. Why should I join your church? Why is it better here, better there? But, what, what, but, but we want to know for sure exactly what we have to do or say to believe. We want to know exactly sure that God's going to come down himself and say, Luella, I have called you to preach. But I don't think God is going to do that. We want to know for certain that in following Jesus, we are on the right path. I don't think he can be any more certain than he is in this gospel. If I had a dime for every time someone asked me, what does ecumenical mean? How did y'all come up with that name? That certainly is not a, a, a regular denomination. That certainly 
is, is, you know, and then you come to realize that Jesus is certainly not in the name or the doctrine that men do for a denomination. The certainty is in Jesus and Jesus alone. In past ages, we have been offered a way, a journey of faith. Some people were foolish enough to follow Jim Jones, and many of them are dead today. They treated him like he was their God. And Lord knows we think about the place up there in Tega K that Tammy, that Jim and Tammy Baker had people sending them money to build. For some reason, they thought that was a glory land. That in giving them money, they were buying their way into heaven. And this, in these texts, on discipleship and teaching and crowds that are hungry for the good news that is the underlying lesson for us in this epiphany. The season of manifestation. We are are shown who Jesus is. God's own beloved. We hear the good news he's bringing But we are also called to respond, to follow in the way of blessings. Not woe, how we respond, how we live, what we do, it matters. There is is no question that poverty is still a national disgrace in the United States where many of us live and preach. Too many children go to bed hungry at night. Even though Henry Kissinger predicted many years ago that the tragedy of this disgrace would be a thing of the past by 1984. Hmm. Well, it's not. And it may be true that a significant number of people in our society have no problem sleeping at night. In spite of this fact, and react angrily when preachers meddle in politics. You want to make somebody mad, get meddle in politics. When you were shine, when we shine that light on the gospel on such suffering. Jesus, consoling words to his disciples from the message Bible, when he predicted the reaction that would get in true, that would get is true for preachers and faithful followers of the gospel today. Matthew 5, 1b through 11. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught the climbing, his climbing companions. This is what he said. See, there were people there and he was in a quiet place and they start climbing up to get to where he was. You are blessed when at the end of your rope, with less of you, there is more of God, and he rules. You're blessed when you feel your loss, what is the most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the ones most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, not more, no less, that the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can be brought, you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He, his, he, he's food, he's drink, he is the best meal that you ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of competing and fighting. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes resurrection. The the resurrection drives you 
to a deeper, deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down, throw you out, <laughs> speak lies about you, discredit you, discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. Happily, many Christians who are uncomfortable with the suffering of the world really want to hear a word of hope, a challenge from their pastor. The Bible is, the Bible is not say you should have, the Bible does not say that you should not have wealth. But the New Testament counsels Christians who seek to live faithfully within the affluent society that wealth is a peril and an obligation. As we examine our lives, questions about our ability or our liberties, to hear God's call free of distractions, and even burdens of possessions, questions about the way we make decisions in our lives and the value those decisions revealed questions about how much our own comfort and possessions rest upon the help and perpetuate unjust structure and institution. And finally, questions about whether we can justify the presence allocation of the material resources in light of the need of those we call brothers and sisters. I have to tell you, I find this hard to do, especially after spending a whole week in Orlando, Disney World, and eating too much, and, and, but enjoying every minute of it. I was convicted. This message is appropriate for all of us who call ourselves Christians. Whether we're in the pulpit, leading Bible study, worshiping together, making decisions in our congregational lives, or just plain members of the congregation. And I say this because sometimes people who consider themselves as just plain members figure sometimes they think that they have no say. They have nothing that they can challenge or nothing that they can address. Sometimes they just go along to get along. But I tell you today that you are. This message is appropriate for you. While God blesses all of us, of course, and God's grace is poured upon us all, rich and poor alike, we might pray for the grace to participate in the reign of generosity proclaimed throughout the Bible. We might come to understand the difference between God's abundance and our access. This approach, of course, does not harmonize with the currently popular prosperity theology, which has enabled many Christians to live quite comfortably with their wealth, to see it as a sign of God's special approval of the way they conduct themselves, or, or man, maybe even those who, who set their pastor on such a high pedestal that even the members can't get to him unless it's his anniversary or his birthday or maybe the first lady's birthday. Then all of a sudden we have a required amount that we have to pay to celebrate the pastor. I know this is a conflicting message. Our money, like every single area of our lives, is subject to the will and direction of God. Our culture says we are just one purchase away from true happiness. Contrast to the message Jesus reassures of blessing, even for the poorest and those powerless and oppress among us. And rather than avoid the most uncomfortable, for many but not for all of us, woes, we might not just reflect in our own 
courageous sermon. But in our ongoing conversation within our congregation about what, about what it means truly, what it truly means to follow Jesus, some of us don't understand. Some of us have been following Jesus based on how our mama followed Jesus. Some of us have been following Jesus based on the denomination follow Jesus. We might be strengthened in our resolve if we remember another lesson that recurs often in the Bible. It's included also in Luke's gospel. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to stand up for Jesus. Do not be afraid to do that which is right. Do not be afraid to challenge those who are wrong. When Luke's Jesus offered those woes as warning, I remember that grace is free and abundant, but it's not cheap. God expects those who have to use their wealth on behalf of the poor. If you are a resident, of the USA, you have. You have. There's always someone that you can reach down and pull up. The lectionary commentary of the gospel, it's as simple as hard, it's as simple and as hard to hear as that. I wonder if our theme this week might have been better stated if I said it was being blessed or not. Or perhaps maybe being blessed, now what? The Ecumenical Church of Christ give thanks to God's abundance. Blessing throughout our history, we have dreamed of a ministry unfolding in ways we could never have dreamed of back in 1996. When our Bishop Redfriend founded a, de a denomination that many are still questioning, much of our ministry has been supported by our faithful generosity of our supporters and Bishop Redfern himself. But Lord knows Bishop Redfern has a faith and he steps out on that faith. He shares in the blessings of everything that he receives with people all over the world. How is your church, your ministry, embroidered in this dream of God? Bringing good news to the poor, not a word of temporary release. See, we want the government to do what the church should be doing. But good news of a world transformed. How are you connected with other churches throughout your community? The United States and the whole world is indeed it is in need of fervent prayer. Together we can accomplish so much more than any one of us can on our own. If we could just come together truly in the way that God would have us to come and pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the God of every land and nation. You have created all people. You dwell among us in Jesus Christ. Lord God, you listen to the cries of those who pray to you. And you grant that as we proclaim the greatness of your name, we allow the presence of Jesus to rest upon our heart. Lord, I pray right now for all people, that all people will know the power of love at work in the world. Help us, Lord, to respond to the divine activity of your mass plan. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.